So I actually, when I was at work, I did get an email stating that they canceled my classes and they said, um, you no longer can attend FIU. And you can imagine the kind of first you're like, what? Like, this is crazy. I didn't think it was that bad or this, that, and the third. So fast forward, I went to the school, tried to plead with them, but they're like, no, based off your conditional admissions, you, you have to, um, you're no longer able to take classes here. And if you're interested in reapplying for the program, you have to wait a few semesters. So it was crazy. I mean, it took me a while to process it. Um, this was towards like probably after the end of my first semester. So in December and trying to tell Caribbean parents that you got kicked out of school and you need to figure out a whole different option. So, I mean, that was a bit much, but thank God my parents were understanding. I mean, things happen and this, you know, definitely pivoted me to like even want to do even better and like try to make sure I finish what I started, um, you know, to move to Miami. I was like, I'm going to get my MPH and that's what I'm going to do. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 84. Hi everyone, Omari Richens here. Be sure to follow me on Instagram at the PH Millennial. Be sure to subscribe to this show, to leave a like, a review, share with a friend, greatly appreciate that. And if you'd like, you can support at buymeacoffee.com forward slash, so buymeacoffee.com forward slash the PH Millennial or the PH Millennial.com forward slash support. This episode I enjoyed a lot. And I think it's it's important to highlight, like even when you're in your worst time, when you're in this moment of failure, it's important to know your why, important to know what your goals are, and important to have a strong support system in order to really persevere and get get through what you're going through. And I think this guest really highlighted that in her journey. And um, I'm looking forward to you all hearing more about that. So without further ado is today's episode. Enjoy. Today we have a public health professional who is aiming to make a difference in people's lives by helping them feel empowered. She got her Bachelor's of Arts in Psychology from the University of South Florida. After graduating, she worked at Big Brothers Big Sisters of Tampa Bay, first as part of the AmeriCorps VISTA program and at Broward Regional Health Planning Council. She then went on to get her Master of Public Health at Nova Southeastern University. She currently works as a Government Operations Consultant at Florida Department of Health. We have Ruth Cooper, MPH. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I really do appreciate this opportunity. It is my pleasure. I just love getting to meet new public health people and hear new public health stories. So I'm glad that we get to connect and you get to share a little bit more about your your public health career and journey up to now. So tell me how are you doing and how you've been coping during these times? I've been doing all right. I think this year I can definitely... um, I definitely think that it was a lot of reflection, just processing what happened last year. Last year, obviously with the pandemic, that definitely impacted everybody in different shapes and forms. Um, For me, I was actually planning a wedding. So imagine trying to plan a wedding and then boom, the pandemic hits. And you know, you know, being in America, we're like, oh yeah, by the summertime, we should be fine. No, probably thinking of a Labor Day, October, November, no. So, you know, just trying to pivot with that. We ended up still having the wedding, but it was outside and definitely being, you know, in the public health, I definitely was trying to think about every little situation or, you know, try to mitigate certain um, risks for people coming, because I know that was one of the first times people were coming out. Um, so we were able to have it outside, make, making sure people were wearing masks, having hand sanitizer as part of um, the um, parting gifts. Um, so just making it work. So, you know, I'm just hanging in there. That's all we can do at this point. So <laughs> that's awesome. Congratulations. I'm glad Thank that you. you you're you're welcome. I'm glad that you were able to, to celebrate and get some people together to celebrate you and your partner and your wedding and your marriage and all of that. That's awesome. Um and yeah, I'm glad that you also took the public health precautions at the time to to ensure that it was as safe as possible. So that's awesome yeah. as well. Yeah. And, and yeah. it's safe to say that, yeah. So it's safe to say that nobody that told me that um got COVID. So thank God for that. So yeah. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. So tell me, how do you identify? And then tell us a little bit about your personal background. Oh, okay. So I'm Haitian American. 
I'm a first generation, so it's me and my little brother. So um, if people are aware of how Caribbean culture works, a lot of times they're very strict. And since, you know, I was the oldest, I literally was the guinea pig. So everything they were trying out on me or telling me, no, this and the third. So my brother got to get away with a lot more stuff than I did. <laughs> so you can imagine how that, that could be. So, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. What else did you want to know? Um, where, I guess I can ask you, where, where did you grow up being a Haitian? American? Okay. Um, so I was born in Boston. Um, when I was about one to two years old, we moved to Chicago. Um, we stayed there for about seven years. And then when I was nine, we relocated to Orlando. Um, so after that, you know, I did from nine to 18, I was pretty much there. So I did elementary through high school there. And then, um, you know, I wanted to get away a little bit, not too far, but, you know, far away, you know, if I need to, you know, get away. Um, so I went to USF in Tampa. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, interesting, you probably have like some good public health experience that you don't even realize public health experience just from like moving around and being yeah. able to experience different places and just see how people live different differently in different places and all of that. So thank you for sharing oh, a little for bit sure. about that. Yeah, no and, I, and I completely uh, understand with your little brother, but I'm also like Trinidadian, so um, oh, Caribbean, okay. Caribbean. Yeah, and <laughs> my little brother definitely got away or gets away with a lot more than, than me and my sister. That, that is oh, absolutely okay. true. <laughs> yeah. Are you the oldest? I'm the middle child. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it wasn't too bad for you. Oh, not at all. My mom loves me. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, so, so tell me, what does uh, public health mean to you? Okay. So with public health, I think it definitely means for me, the general, um, you know, health of the population. So, I mean, public health is just not, because it's just one of those things. I remember starting my grad school program and people were like, oh, what is that? Like, it's kind of hard to explain, especially to Caribbean parents. They're like, okay, well, what is that? What are you going to do with that kind of degree? Um, but I mean, when you think about the, the five core principles of, you know, the um, the breakdown of programs, stuff like that with, you know, health prevention, disease prevention, health promotion, maternal and child health, epidemiology. Um, I know definitely right now, public health is more in the forefront due to the pandemic, because especially with epidemiology, you know, they need a lot more contact tracers or epidemiologists. Um, so it was definitely kind of cool to see it be more in the forefront, even though public health is something that needs to be focused on or more funding needs to be on it more, obviously. Um, but I just think it's the overall wellness, you know, health of the population, because, you know, obviously you can see with this pandemic is definitely affecting a lot of people. Um, you know, so I think it's definitely bringing public health more in the forefront as it should be. Absolutely. And yes, we, we continue to need more investment in public health and we will need more. And it's interesting that we don't get more investment in public health because of all the like positive factors economically that you do get from like investing in early childhood, investing in education, investing in clean water and clean infrastructure and parks and recreation. But that's that's um, I don't have the scope to, to handle why that is not changed as yet, but I hope that, uh, mm -hmm. that it does get the investment and the, like, I guess the pandemic has given it the attention. So we just need the investment now. So yeah, 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 absolutely. And uh, thank you for sharing a little about like, not even being in grad school, not knowing how to explain public health. Um, and I think that's absolutely fine. And I'm going to ask you more about that late, later mm -hmm. on, but you got your bachelor's of arts in psychology from the university of yeah. South Florida. So what was the thought process for, for doing that? You said you were in Orlando and you wanted to get away. So you went to USF, which is like two hours, maybe a little bit more away from there, but what was the thought process behind like the schooling side of it? Um, yeah. So when I first was trying to look for school and stuff like that, I probably was just like, oh, I want to go out of state, but I ended up just choosing USF because I did fall in love with the campus. Um, and it was when at the time USF wasn't what USF is now. I mean, it was just one of those schools like, oh, okay, I guess I'll go there. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I originally, when I first went to USF, I started as a pre-athletic training major, um, slash pre-med because I was going in there like oh I'm gonna be an athletic trainer and then I'm gonna go to medical school and be an orthopedic surgeon um but as many freshmen you fall into those weed out classes and the certain classes such as pre-calc and physics 
I didn't do so well in those. So I've just had to kind of, you know, take a step back and see, okay, what do I really want to do? I don't want to be wasting time in school because, you know, with Caribbean folk, they always all up in your face saying, oh, when you're going to graduate, what are you doing? Are you just wasting money? This, that, and the third. Um, so just keeping that in mind. And also, I didn't want to waste time. I didn't want to be one of those people that stayed forever because I don't know if you know with USF, the, you know, funny acronym joke behind it is like, you stay forever, USF. Um, and I didn't want to be one of those people. I didn't want to be those people just hit cha- hit, chilling out in the Marshall Student Center, just, you know, just taking classes just to take classes. Um, so that being said, I was just trying to look at certain things that I was interested in. Um, psychology came up. So I ended up changing my major um, after failing a couple of courses and just thinking like, yeah, I could do one step, like we take these courses and see if I can do it again. But at the same time, I didn't want to waste time. So I just felt like it was probably not for me to be an athletic trainer. Um, so I did psychology. And so when I majored in psychology, I didn't really know what I was going to do with that because some of these classes in school, they were telling me, oh, well, you need to get a master's in this or that to really, you know, practice your degree. Um, so I actually did a minor in public health um, because I was like, oh, okay, this is really interesting. I took one of these classes, like I think it was sex health and um, decision making. Um, so it really um, was really interesting to me. And I'm just like, oh, okay, this is a minor. Let me take some of these classes. They're very interesting. So why not? And then after probably one year or a couple of semesters into the doing the minor, they actually made it a major. But I was just like, oh, it would take too much, you know, too much additional time just to make it a whole major. So I just ended up using it as a minor. So okay. yeah. well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That that gives a lot of insights. And just to I guess to summarize everything you say, or like, let me know if I'm, if I'm capturing everything correctly, went mm-hmm. into to undergrad as a pre-athletic pre-med major, wanting to be an orthopedic surgeon or mm-hmm. something of that cause, changed to psychology because a lot of the, the readout classes that were hard in like the sciences, um, but then you weren't sure what you can do with psychology going, mm-hmm. well, you were hearing that with psychology, you'd have to take a master's level to actually like practice psychology. Yeah which is mm-hmm. in fact true um, in a lot of cases. And then you, they, so you said you took a, a sex health and, and education class and that was what like led you into knowing about public health and then decided yeah. to get the minor in public health? Yep. Awesome, awesome. But unfortunately you were also unable to get a public health major because you found out about public health too late or they, they created a public health major too late within your career journey. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think it was like my junior year and I'm like, mm, I'm not staying additional few semesters. Yeah, because after a certain time, you know, Florida Bright Future does run out and the parents just like, yeah, you got to figure this out on your own. So um, I just did it that way. Okay, so before we go to your America Vista program and ask you about what you did while you were in USF, what, what was like your thought process for what you would do after your bachelor's in psychology, minor in public health, knowing or like just with the information that people are telling you, you need to do a master's. Is that what you were thinking or did you just not know what you were thinking or was public health the thing that you were thinking? Um, Knowing with a lot of degrees, like with human service and stuff like that, most likely you have to get additional education to actually make it more um, beneficial for you to actually make a decent amount of money. Um, So I already knew that from the jump. Um, so I just knew that, you know, with psychology, there's certain courses I was taking. I'm like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can be, you know, a health, um, mental health therapist or a counselor in certain, um, specialization. Um, so that was definitely on my mind. One of the things that definitely, um, were interested to me is possibly doing marriage and family therapy. Um, so at a certain time I was just like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can get my degree in that. Also probably doing like an MPH as well. So I just started to look at programs that combine that. Um, yeah. So I just went from there okay. to, for my thought process. Okay. Awesome. So you, so you knew about the MPH and things like that while you were doing your undergrad? Yes. Okay. Not, not like, that's not common for people that I talk to on this podcast for at least for, for the most really? part. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so you are lucky in that sense that you like, you're lucky in the sense that you got to know public health early as well as get that minor in public health. Cause I think a lot of people kind of like fall into public health in a lot of ways. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. So while you were at USF, you also reach peer educator at wellness USF. So tell me about that experience. Yes. 
Okay, so from one of the courses that um, that brought me, um, you know, into the public health world, the professor was actually um, the supervisor of that particular program. Um, so I'm just like, oh, well, I'm trying to get more involved on campus. Let me see what this is all about because you were doing presentations in front of um, your peers. So I'm just like, this will help build more self confidence and make me feel more comfortable speaking in front of people. Um, so I definitely took that opportunity to do so. So certain stuff that we did um, in the Reach Peer program was um, we did actually like a sexual health expo. Um, so we definitely were able to reach out to different organizations, um, different partners outside in the community. Um, like for example, like um, there was like a sex store. So we actually had them donate toys and condoms and stuff like that. I mean, you know, with college students, a lot of people, some people are very active. So, I mean, it was very beneficial. Um, also, we did a, um, a fashion show, just promoting different types of body shapes, stuff like that, um, for people to, you know, with self-esteem and body issues. So we definitely did something like that. Um, but it definitely did, um, we did things such as um, presentations on alcohol, um, safe sex, um, general wellness, um, things like that. So I know with that particular program at that time, because I know that they had MP, they before they were making the, um, the public health as a major undergrad, they already had MPH program there. Um, and then just hearing stuff like around like the school and they were seeing how the program was very good. Um, they had their whole campus and stuff like that. So one of the people I actually worked with, she was actually in the MPH program. And a lot of the girls that I worked with, they actually were considering in their MPH. Um, so I always knew at a certain point, I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is definitely an option for me. You know, I love working here. This is a pretty cool opportunity working at, you know, your university. Um, so that definitely brought uh, my attention to it. Um, so, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that, that's a lot of good health education work that you got to do there as, as well as I think it's cool that you got the exposure to people with the MPHs and was yeah. able to say, oh, these people are doing this work and they have this degree and I can probably ask them more about that as well as yeah. just see that this is the kind of work that I kind of like doing as well. Um, so, so that makes a lot of sense. Um, did you have any other takeaways that you wanted to share from undergrad? It was amazing. I mean, going to a PWI, like a predominantly white institution, I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, misconceptions or, you know, people think, oh, you don't get the full experience or, you know, you shouldn't went to a HBCU. Yeah, sometimes I wish I went to a HBCU, but I mean, I'm definitely appreciative of going to a diverse place where I was able to be exposed to a lot of things that I may not have been able to at a different school or institution. Um, but I'm just appreciative that I was exposed to public health in the way I was because I definitely created that love for me for, you know, generally want to help people and just want people to be informed because you'd be surprised with certain information that we may know the general person may not. And it's just crazy. If they don't hear from us, who are they going to hear it from? That is, that is big facts. And that, that's why like, I encourage people just to speak up in like, any situation because People just have conversations generally, and that's the information that they intake in to learn about things. And when you are able to like give them some positive health information or just make them critically think what they're thinking about to, to make them help help them make a better decision, I think all of that is, is very important. And yeah, USF is really, really, I, I had a lot of good times in undergrad going up to USF for like some Caribbean parties. There are some really good Caribbean parties at the USF. So oh, you went to CCE parties? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was lit. It was lit. <laughs> oh, I already know about those. Yeah, those are very lit. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh. Uh, so so you after you graduated, you went on to become a AmeriCorps Vista at Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Tampa Bay. So how did you come across that? Um, I knew I didn't want to go to um, grad school right after. I wanted to take a break, but I also wanted to get experience. And I also wanted to um, get assistance with paying my student loans. Uh, one of the great perks of AmeriCorps is that um, they give you a stipend or you can choose for them to pay a certain portion of your loans. Um, so I definitely went with that option. Um, at first, I didn't really think I was going to stay in Florida. Um, it's just the way the cookies fell. Not cookies fell, but it's just the way it happened, which is fine. But I just felt like it was really good that I got the opportunity in Tampa because I already knew the area. I knew where I can stay because with AmeriCorps, the stipend that they give you, the living stipend, it's based off the, the amount, like average income of the 
the population. Location. So yeah, let's yeah. just, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's like, you're not getting paid a lot. So oh, Kyrie yeah. used to being broke. So mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, okay, this is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I mean, you're getting like, I think it's like 150 or 200% of the poverty level or above the poverty mm-hmm. level. So um, I just felt like it was a perfect time to do it because I'm just thinking I wouldn't want to do it now in my life because I'm kind of <laughs> used to a certain lifestyle that's not going to be conducive. Um, so yeah, so I definitely did the opportunity just to kind of get exposed. And I mean, it definitely, um, with the psychology portion, like you're working with kids and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, this seems pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. That, that's awesome. And yeah, that, I do think there are some like equity issues or like concerns with the America Vista programs because, because of those low stipends that they do give you it only, it incentivizes people who are more well off to be able to take those programs as opposed to people who are like really in the community because they actually and really like in the community from the community without like all the resources that that they are not like affluent as other people but they don't they they mm-hmm. can't take that little stipend because because I've heard of many instances where miracle vistas are like on food stamps and yeah and doing I all, was yeah yeah, yeah. It's, just, it's a very very interesting like organization however it does provide a lot of beneficial experience to the people that are going through it as well as to the organizations that utilize it but there there are some things that could be more equitably done for for that program but oh of course because i've known some people i had a friend that did it and she was doing in dc and it was really rough for her so i mean i was just thinking the organization i was doing it with thankfully it wasn't you know what i mean it was fine and i was just like i'm used to the area so that i think was a leg up for me if i went to another city i don't know how my experience would have been probably would have been you know equally as great but it'll probably have been different challenges that i had to face okay yeah yeah and i think i think like that that's something that people don't talk about enough around america vistas and those other vista programs that they have out there but yeah that th- thank you for noting that so what, what did you do as, as an American Vista at the Big Brothers Big Sisters of Tampa Bay? Okay, so I was a mentor manager. Um, so I pretty much oversaw matches with bigs and littles. So bigs were the adult volunteers and the littles were the children. Um, so I was focused at a school. I had a few sites and one of those sites was actually um, elementary school at USF. So I was like, oh, okay, this is close to home. This is perfect. Um, so I was able to match kids with bigs as well. So I also did volunteer interviews. So I was able to um, see if the adult was fit to be a, a volunteer in the program because, you know, there are certain criteria that they do look for and stuff like that. So they do ask you about, you know, your mental state, if stuff, what happened to you, you know, in your childhood, things like that, because that could definitely affect the relationship with the child. So I was able to do that along with managing um, matches, just, you know, doing, you know, support for them, just, at, you know, doing interviews with the volunteer and the little just to see if everything was going well, if they felt like they were benefiting from the relationship, if it was being productive. So I did those kind of things and also help with, um, because they would have some things that like fundraisers at Big Brothers Big Sisters. So I would help assist with that as well. Okay. And like here I have written that you were mentor manager as well as site-based match specialist. Did you do like both of these type of roles at the same time? Yes. You know, with nonprofits, you wear many hats. <laughs> that is true. So, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of the times, like, my positions were intertwined. So, I mean, we were matching kids at a site. So, like, an elementary school, um, like, um, and then also a different, like, boys and girls clubs. We definitely had relations with them. So, we would match kids, you know, at a public site, um, you know, so it's safe and stuff like that for both the adult and the child. Um, so, yes, I did that as well. All right. Thank you for sharing that. And that, how, how long were you in America Vista, like total time? I was, um, I was in the program for a year. Okay. A year. And then, and then I, after that, yeah, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so then after that, you were ACA navigator program coordinator at Broward Regional Health Planning Council. So is, is that what you were going to say? No, I was going to actually say I was hired by Big Brothers Big Sisters afterward. They offered me a position. Mm-hmm. Um, and I stayed with them for about two, three years. And then after that, I needed a change. Um, I, you know, it was time for me to go to grad school. You know, I wanted, you know, increase in pay. I needed some stuff to shake up. So then I moved to Miami to go to grad school. Okay. So the, what type of work did you do with Big Brothers Big Sisters after they hired you into a full-time position? 
Oh, I did pretty much the same work. But yeah, okay. I was getting, yeah, I got benefits, got more pay. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, awesome, awesome. Okay, so, so, then, so then you moved down to, so, so tell me this process, because you, I also know that in your journey, you were like conditionally accepted to FIU yeah. and then they, I guess, didn't fulfill or whatever, however, that, however you, you phrase that. Was mm -hmm. that before the ACA navigator position? Like, tell, tell me, what was that process? That was during. Yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So, okay. So when I moved down to Miami, um, well, prior to moving to Miami, I was applying for a bunch of grad schools. Um, and I think a lot of people don't talk about this as well, is that sometimes um, not everybody is a good test taker. So, you know, like with GRE and stuff like that, you know, sometimes it doesn't reflect the true, you know, nature of a person. Um, so I was really banking on, you know, my letters of recommendation and my personal statement. Um, so I was applying to a bunch of schools and at first I was getting a lot of rejection. So it was very hard. So I had to kind of seek and, you know, ask God, I'm like, is this what you want me to do? I'm not happy here in Tampa anymore. Like I need to get out of here. Like I just need a change. I need a shift. Um, so honestly, I actually saw like a billboard about FIU when I was driving to work one day. So I was like, oh, okay, let me check this out. You know, Miami, you know, I don't know. I guess what people think about Miami, you know, you're like, oh yeah, South Beach and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. This is a bit, you know, a bit much, you know, I need to focus on school and stuff. Um, so fast forward, I did apply. Um, I did get a conditional admissions, which means, um, you have to meet a certain amount of requirements in order to get a full acceptance. So you can take classes for the first semester, but you have to meet a certain GPA. Um, when I think about it now, um, I had took one of the courses I took um, my first semester was statistics. I'm not a big math person, stuff like that. So when I look back at it now, I probably should have took that my second semester after I was schooling in. Um, but I was trying to, I guess I went on thinking about it. I was trying to do a lot. Like I was trying to get... Um, the you know public health experience so I actually was an ACA navigator part-time um, in Hollywood and you know I was going to school at FIU the south campus which is in like near Doral so you can imagine that I don't know if you're familiar with Miami but um, the south Florida area but that was a bit of a drive like I would leave work probably 1 32 o'clock and then have to get to class at five so when I'm thinking about my experience at FIU I just felt like I was forcing a puzzle piece to go into a puzzle that it, it wasn't working. And then I had to realize that towards the end, I'm like, man, I'm really trying to make this work. I'm trying to do my best, but things just weren't working. Um, so actually when I was at work, I did get an email stating that they canceled my classes and they said, um, you no longer can attend FIU. And you can imagine the kind of first like, what? Like, this is crazy. I didn't think it was that bad or this, that, and the third. So fast forward, I went to the school, tried to plead with them, but they're like, no, based off your conditional admissions, you, you have to, um, you're no longer able to take classes here. And if you're interested in reapplying for the program, you have to wait a few semesters. So it was crazy. I mean, it took me a while to process it. Um, this was towards like probably after the end of my first semester. So in December and trying to tell Caribbean parents that you got kicked out of school and you need to figure out a whole different option. So, I mean, that was a bit much, but thank God my parents were understanding. I mean, things happen and this, you know, definitely pivoted me to like even want to do even better and like try to make sure I finish what I started, um, you know, to move to Miami. I was like, I'm going to get my MPH and that's what I'm going to do. Um, so I ended up taking a semester break and then try to figure out what schools that I was going to try to apply to and see, okay, what is the next option? Am I going to move out of Miami or am I just going to stay here? Um, I ended up, you know, still staying at my job at Broward Regional Planning Council. And um, I ended up going to Nova in the spring semester, just taking classes, paying out of pocket. And God, my parents were able to help me pay for some of those courses until I got a full admission to the program. Okay. Wow. 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 <laughs> yeah, it was a mouthful. <laughs> uh, no, but I can only imagine like all, all of what you're going through. And yes, I completely agree. GRE is test. Those kind of like standardized tests on for everyone. And I'm glad that a lot of like MBA schools now have gotten rid of them. But yeah. But regardless, like, wow. But kudos for you for like pushing on and saying like, I, I moved to Miami, even though I, it's not working out with FIU. I'm yeah. still going to 
push through and do this. I'm going to pay out of pocket. I'm going to like do what I have to do to get this MBH yeah. to get to get to where I want to. So, so from from getting kicked out of the program to to taking classes at Nova South uh, Southeastern was that like one semester time time lapse there? No, it was two semesters. So I took um, the spring semester off. So I entered FIU's program in fall 2015. So spring 2016, I took that semester off. And then I do believe, I think it was either summer. Yeah, I think I started in the summer. Cause I was just like, I don't want to take a, you know, too much of a break. I want to keep this momentum up. This, this particular situation that occurred to me, I'm just like, I'm going to make sure I'm going to get my stuff done. I think it's more so of that Caribbean fight. Like we're going to get this thing. We're going to push through. So that was my mentality because I didn't want to, um, just go, let it go by the wayside and just do it. You know, I was just determined to get this degree. So. Okay. Well, awesome. Kudos for you for, for, for like having that burning passion to continue and motivation to, to push through it, especially through like, like that kind of adversity and all those things are probably going on through your head and shout out to like your, your parents and whoever else were there to support you during that time. Cause I, I can only imagine how tough that was. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so one other question um, well, not one other question, but one other question about yeah. this. Um, so your MPH, at, during your MPH at Nova South, Southeastern, were you the ACA navigator as well, or did you stop doing that? Yes, I was. So I was ACA navigator. They was able, and then after that, they really liked the work that I did, and then I was into an, um, transferred to another program full-time. So that's when I began uh, being the one app specialist for um, the Early Learning Childhood Coalition Department. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And that was all at Broward Regional Health Planning Council, correct? Yes. Okay. And then I also have here that you had a MSNBC discussion around ACA enrollment. So I wanted to give you a little space to like drop some knowledge around that if you'd like to. Okay, sure. Um, so this had to be, I'm thinking this was 2016 or 2017. Um, they, this was probably the last portion of like, I think the last few days of the open enrollment. Um, so they reached out to, um, my organization. They're like, Hey, you want to do a piece on, you know, open enrollment? Are you guys interested? My supervisor at the time, she was like, Oh no, I do not want to be on TV. And I'm <laughs> like, Hey, we need to show my more diverse faces. I'm going to take this moment. I'm going to make sure that, you know, I represent. Um, so it was pretty cool, you know, they had me in one of the interview rooms, like on the ACA website, and they were just interviewing me live. So, I mean, it was a pretty dope experience. I mean, I was very fortunate to be able to have that experience and be able to take advantage of that because I just love when you have those opportunities and moments, it's good for people, of, especially people of color to take advantage of that because just like, hey, then you just see diverse faces, people doing the work and stuff like that. So yeah and, and shout out like that that's that's also great on you for realizing like because you super you said your supervisor was like ah no I didn't want to like be on tv but then you're like but well, we, we should definitely get on there to show like diversity and especially like in this work and especially knowing like what I know now that not, not many people know about public health and all the different roles that you can do in public health I think it's, it's hugely important to show them that there are a lot of different pathways to get in there and like exposing them to to as you said like different faces um, and that diverse face faces that that they can actually identify with uh, for, for many, yeah. many many people um, okay awesome all right thank you for sharing that mm -hmm. so, so how, how was that process? You said at Nova, when you were getting your MPH at Nova Southeastern, it was you took classes before you actually got into the program full-time? Yes. So, so tell me um, about that. Yeah, I, I don't know if that was one of the, yeah. So I think I was just trying to keep my momentum up because I think by the time the semester came, I think I missed a deadline to apply for that particular semester. So I wanted to take a few classes prior. So some of the professors can get to know me and just kind of, increase my chance of getting in <laughs> um so that's why I probably did it that way and plus yeah because I think it was more so about the application deadline okay well yeah I'm glad that you continued and you got through did you have a concentration while you were at uh, Nova South Southeastern with that particular program they don't have concentrations it's um different from FIU they have a specialized um you know track that you go to and you can take you know additional classes you know based off your interests um, so no, it was just a general degree. But when I was at FIU, my focus track was 
um, health promotion, disease prevention. Okay, I was I was about to ask you that, so thank you for answering that question for me. Um, okay, so general, did did you w- did you mold your classes to 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 the same sort of like concentration that you would have wanted in like FIU, yes. and and was that easy easily to do? Yeah. Yeah, so I just, you know, you just look in the thing when it's time for you to enroll in classes and they had certain courses that you can take. So I just geared it towards my interest and what I wanted to do. Okay, awesome. And did you have any other takeaways during your MPH that you wanted to share? Um, I would say, I, I guess it's a little, it was a little different at um, Nova. I don't know. I was thinking, because one of my reasons why I wanted to go to FIU, because it reminded me of USF. Um, and I was having this big idea in my head, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to be involved in campus, going to be like undergrad, this, that, and the third. But it was a little bit of a different experience because I was a little bit older and I was working because during my shift when I was going to Nova, I was working. It was like I was part time and then I was going to full time. So I was working full time and going to school full time. So um, did I say that right? Going to work full time and going to school full time. Um, so that's a little bit different as opposed to being, you know, re- you know, full-time student, being able to go on campus, do this, that, and third, because there was certain stuff at Nova I wanted to get involved in. But like, for example, they had like a um, public health student association for grad students, I think. Um, but the meetings met like during the day. And I'm like, I can't do that, you know, working full-time. So, I mean, it was a different experience. So I think especially for like people that do aspire to get an MPA, so they do need to take that in consideration. Um, based off the age, you know, how old you are and like where your life is at. Like if you're trying to get that full experience, maybe you need to work part time or just focus, you know, I mean, more on the degree as opposed to working. So it all depends on the student because my experience was a little bit different than what I expected it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. And I, I guess that, that does make sense as, as you did get older with the full time job. But that also is a note to anyone that is running or helping run any um, public health student organizations on campus, make your meetings more accessible for people that have full time jobs because they want yes. to they want to engage as well and um, not yeah. giving them opportunities stealing from them. So so that is my uh, my plea for, for t- today's episode to do that. Um, and then after you graduated you became a disaster recovery program coordinator at Broward Regional Health Planning Council. So, okay, so before that, did you work at Broward Regional Health Council throughout your entire MPH and then get a full-time job afterwards? Yeah, so I was, so I actually moved up. So I went from part-time to full-time and then another, I went back to the ACA program because um, the program coordinator at the time, she went to a different program so they needed somebody. Um, it was doing a lot of shifting because you know with nonprofits, like with funding and stuff like time, funding funding um, sources and stuff like that, sometimes they take money away or they give you money. So at the time, the program that I was in with the Early Learning Coalition, they um, they brought the program back to the actual organization. So that program was no longer going to exist at BRHPC. Um, so at the time, you know, I had the opportunity to go with the organization or just stay at BRHPC. So I ended up staying at BRHPC because they needed um, a lead navigator um, for the ACA navigator program. And I'm like, oh, I love this position. It's got me into this organization. Why not? I really do like enjoying, you know, helping people enroll in plans because you'd be surprised what people don't know about insurance. Um, so I was able to do that. So after that, um, the manager, she left to go to another program and they um, hired me within to be the lead um, program coordinator. Yeah, awesome. Well, yeah, and I think that also goes to show like if you do have those connections during like your MPH and you're doing that work, well, you said that you were full-time and then moved into a new full-time role when you graduated. But yeah. I think that also goes to show that you, like, you're building experience while also building relationship, while also building like institutional knowledge of the organization and understanding of all the programs and things that are going on there. And that gives you leverage to get a full-time position after you graduate. Um, oh, or, yeah. Or a better full-time position after you graduate, I should say, as well. Um, so, so tell me, what, what did you do in the, as a disaster recovery program coordinator? Okay, so I oversaw case managers. Um, so pretty much they were dealing um, with um, families impacted by Hurricane Irma. So they got funding from the state. 
um, well, actually from the federal government, they funded the, um, the state and they gave us, we were one of the grantees. So they were able to give us some of the money um, to help assist these people that were having issues with their homes. So a lot of the places had um, issues with their roofs. They had leaking and mold, stuff like that. Um, so we worked with United Way because um, we were some contractor under United Way and um, were able to help assist these clients um, with their times of need because a lot of them had different issues. For example, one of the clients that we worked with, she had um, custody of her grandchildren, um, but she was having issues with Hurricane Irma, like damage, stuff like that. So it's just interesting with hurricanes, how sometimes, you know, the hurricane may pass like a year or two ago, but people are still, you know, suffering from it because, you know, it takes time, you know, for them to get repairs or insurance doesn't cover certain things or they didn't meet the deductible. Uh, so it's more of an eye opener, like with the case management portion, because you're hearing people's stories and you want to find resources for them to help them. Okay. Yeah. And, and that, that is important. And yeah, like, especially with like more hurricanes, more storms that are coming, there's going to be a lot more of that type of work that is needed. And of course, especially when there's water involved in like structures, there's a lot of times damage that happens or like that cascades until you take care of the fundamental things and as we all know a lot of the the aid especially to to, to lower socioeconomic people or communities takes a long time and there are a lot of barriers for them to access that aid to actually get their life back up and running so thank you for that work um it, that, that's cool i also wanted to ask before i move on to your next position mm -hmm. did did your mph like embody and like was it everything that you expected it to be and did you learn the things that you needed to advance your career in your reflections now <laughs> uh, i feel like yes and no i feel like even now i think like especially people who have mphs or aspiring to get mphs or are working to get it i mean what you think you may actually get the end, like with the end job, you may not exactly get that. I mean, it may take some time. So, I mean, I'm glad I was appreciative of the courses that I took. Um, I did take a lot away from it. And for me, it was kind of cool working like in a public health sector where I can kind of apply some of these things. But yeah, I guess I can answer the question. I mean, it's a yes or no kind of thing. I mean, I was thinking I was going to be one thing when I ended like getting my MPH, but I don't know if I'm there yet. I think it's one of those things that, you know, I'm, I'm on the road to getting it, like that job that I want, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that makes sense. And it, it like the MPH, I think, gives you like a lot of foundational skill sets. And it's really like building upon that and, and learning like new experiences and things to really get you to, to where you, you need to go. So I, I completely understand with your yes and your no, because people do like envision, okay, I have my bachelor's in public health or whatever. I'm doing this type of work. If I get my MPH, I'm going to like get catapulted to, to another level of work. But that for the most part is not the case. Um, yeah. You really, if, if you want that to be the case, you really got to leverage a lot of opportunities and experiences during your MPH to, to, to get you to, to that place like earlier and quicker than, than traditionally. Because, and as we say this, like we have to also understand that MPH schools have just gotten the most amount of people applying to MPH schools. So the competition coming out of MPH programs within the next two, three years is gonna be very, very tough. And as it is right now, it's, it's very tough for like people with MPHs yeah. who just graduated yeah. to get jobs. So, so yeah. Re yeah, so really, really, really think about these things uh, while, while you are thinking about getting an MPH or if you're taking an MPH, make sure that you, you're taking the steps to really advance your career afterwards. Um, so yeah yeah I definitely agree because I just feel like MPH getting MPH is a springboard I feel like with a lot of master's programs it's a springboard but I feel like that's just it's not like getting a JD or MD like you gotta do a lot more work to you know you know make your MPH work I say so I mean I definitely agree like it's gonna be oversaturated with the job market like even sometimes when me and my friends are exchanging like positions, stuff like that. It's like an oversaturated market. Like for example, trying to get an adjunct position and like a public health course, it's hard because everybody and their mom was trying to get that same <laughs> class that you're trying to get. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and I, and I think that that that's important to highlight. But I I also think there's a lot of potential for like new jobs in in like 
non-traditional public health sectors i know like, oh, for, for sure. like like for example i always bring up the the hospitality industry how they're like pulling in a lot of epidemiologists and like disease investigators into their types of work and i think that is going to be the case for a lot of organizations going forward and and as i always say once again like public health gives you a lot of skill sets that you can use for a variety of different settings so it's really up to you to determine how how you're going to use those skill sets and, and learn and leverage them to to do the type of work that you would like to do yeah okay well thank you for sharing that um Okay, so moving on to your current role, uh, you work as a government operations consultant at Florida Department of Health. So how do you come across this role? Um, so I was, what year was this? 2019, yes. Yeah. So um, my program was ending. So the disaster case management program was ending due to the funding because it was only like a two-year program. Um, so one of those things like working with nonprofits, you have to be mindful of that because, you know, they only have the money for X amount of time. And if they're not doing a renewal, you have to kind of find another option. So uh, that was um, one of those things that catapulted like, oh, okay, well, this is probably a great chance just to leave. Um, so I found the position on Indeed. I went in for the interview. Um, I thought I did okay, but they called me the second time. I'm like, oh, I did great. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I felt like I really wooed the, um, the supervisor. So I felt like that's why, that's how I um, came for the second interview. But um, yeah, it was one of those positions I found in Indeed. Like that was one of those things I always thought I wanted to do. Um, I was definitely work for a health department or like CDC. So I was like, oh, okay, this is a perfect timing. And I'm just thinking it's so interesting for me now, I'm just like with the pandemic, when the pandemic first hit, I'm like, wow, I'm working at the health department. I am right there. You know, when the vaccines come, I'll be one of the first people to get it. I mean, you know, it was one of those cool things just to kind of be there, just to see what kind of things are going on. Because, you know, we were doing contact tracing, doing those kind of things and just trying to get all the information when it first came out. So, I mean, um, it was just one of those cool experiences. Okay, awesome. And yeah, thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask you, what are the things you think you did to woo the supervisor <laughs> in, that, in that first interview to get them to the second one? Um, I would say, you know, the funny thing is, um, I said, like, he was asking me, oh, okay, like, tell me about yourself. So I said I was from Boston. So he was actually from Boston too. So it was kind of cool. Like, oh, okay, the connection. So I think he was more engaged that I said that. Um, but I did actually have, you know, the experience to do some portions of the job. Um, one of those things I would say for, you know, people that have MPHs or, you know, trying to be in the public health world is like, yeah, a position may be something, but try to figure out how your degree applies to that or certain skills that you have um, can make you more marketable for the position. For the position I, I'm currently in is a contract manager. Um, you know, with working with like, you know, state positions, they give you a fancy title, but I mean, what I actually do is like managing contracts. Um, so I was doing it from the subcontractor side. Um, so I was a person receiving the funds and stuff like that for the program to fund my position and my coworkers. Um, so it was kind of interesting with that because I'm just like, I had some, um, some of the experience that they were looking for, even though it was probably not the total package, but I had some kind of base to work with. So it wasn't like I was totally green to, for the position. Okay, yeah, that, and, and that's awesome. And, and yeah, I think that, that goes to show like really have to bring, bring like your best self to that first interview and also be personable, like that Boston relationship. I feel like it's always those, those non-job related things that, that, that you relate to someone with that also helps like build that, that connection, that rapport, that willingness for them to like want to hire you more than, than mm -hmm. someone else. Um, so what, what do you do in this role? I, I, I don't know if you touched on it or anything, but yeah, you can share it again, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, so I manage contracts. So um, what we do is do te provide technical support, process invoices, receive invoices. We do monitorings. Um, so we do administrative monitoring, just making sure that they follow the guidelines provided by the state. Also with the, um, the other monitoring that we do is like more, it's a programmatic. So based off the, um, the terms of the contract, making sure they're following the guidelines, making sure that they're spending the monies appropriately. Um, and, then, and then with these programs, most of them are obviously public health related. So for example, one of the contracts that I oversee is um, for cancer patients. So it's cancer patients that um, 
they are legal docu um, legal documented Im um, immigrants. Um, so they're able to receive cancer treatments for free. So, um, and then another, for example, another one is like security guards, like managing the health, um, just overseeing the health sites, like the different um, public health locations, like the public health departments in our locations. Okay, awesome. Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And then earlier, you well, like they literally just now, you you said that you were on the subcontractor side before, and now you're on another side. Can you explain mm -hmm. that to me? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, the subcontractor is pretty much like one entity is getting the money, but they're actually giving a second, like another company organization, like some of the portion of their money to do the services that they are they were giving the grant monies for. Um, for example, for a previous organization, uh, when I was at BRPC, we were the subcontractor um, for some of the um, services for disaster case management. Because the main fund, like the main grantee was United Way, but they subcontracted um, the services to many other organizations like us. So right now, what I'm doing is overseeing the, um, the entities and like their subcontractors that they have any to make sure that they're spending the money correctly. So it's interesting going from this particular view being the person trying to make sure that there's, because I've seen it from an opposite end. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it is pretty cool. And it is public health when you think about it because it's a different portion that people probably don't think about. Cause I think a lot of people think about, oh, I'm going to be a health teacher or be in the hospital, things like that. But I, again, it's the one of those things that we talk about just making sure making your degree work for you. Like, as you mentioned earlier, how um, there's gonna be different places where people may not think that you need somebody that's in public health and has an MPH, but that is gonna be the future. Like, for example, you'll probably see a Coca-Cola hiring like a public health professional to do disease intervention or health wellness. Like, that is gonna be one of those things and you just gotta make it work and just make yourself marketable to get those type of jobs. Cause you, you said it yourself, it is gonna be oversaturated. So you just gotta kind of figure out where you fit in. Absolutely, absolutely. And to that, in, like in that vein, what, what do you think, like knowing that what you know now about your job, what, what, what would you tell someone like trying to get into your job? What kind of advice or like skill sets or things like that would you tell them to build on to, to get into your job? Um, I would say, because I would say, because we've been doing interviews for our, our department, actually. So a lot of people are coming from the subcontractor side people don't realize certain stuff that the job is requiring that you probably may do. For example, they say, oh, do you have any experience reviewing invoices? A lot of people, when you think about have experience reviewing invoices, when you think about receipts or like stuff you're paying for it, you have student organizations, um, things like that. Because some people that are coming to getting their MPH or like coming um, straight out of school, they may not have some of the experience, but building from your classes, your class projects, or student organizations or other life experiences um, of reviewing certain things. I just feel like making whatever you your life experience work for you in an interview, being personable, being prepared, you have no idea what, how many people come to our um, office for an interview and don't know what public health is. They do not know what the departments of um, the health department, like what kind of part departments health department has. I'm like, come on now, like you could you at least memorize two or three, like, come <laughs> on. And it's just crazy how some people, these are things that you would think people would know or at least know two or three. They could easily say COVID, COVID contact tracing, vaccinations. But I mean, again, like it's one of those things like when you're interviewing for a position, like it's good to have that practice, talking to somebody that may be able to help you, you know, with interview questions, coming prepared, you know, because sometimes if you're not used to interviewing or you're a little rusty, you need to, you know, get some oil on those wheels. So, I mean, just, you know, making your experiences work for you because certain positions, you may not have the actual, you know, experience, experience but you may have something that, they, that may help you to, you know, level up or for them to take time to invest in you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think I get goes back to like perspective. Perspective is, is so important and how you're viewing the things that you're doing and how you're translating that into public health work. And that is crazy that people will come into an uh, interview for the health department and not know anything about the health department. So e easy Google, it's an easy Google search, you know? Exactly. And for me, having MPH, I'm like, oh, why have you answered the question like this? Come on, man. But I mean, hey, it is what it is. Yeah, they, they were not suited for the role, that is for sure. 
So where do you want to see yourself in the future? <sighs> That's such a great question. Um, I definitely want to see myself like helping still continuing to help educate people um, like on public health awareness topics. Um, I think it goes back to the roots where I first started, where I first got immersed with public health. Um, so if I can see myself like at the CDC or doing big public health awareness campaigns, you know, um, I think that'd be awesome. I mean, at the end of the day, I just want to help people. So if I'm able to, you know, share some knowledge that people previously didn't know, or they're able to do stuff a little bit differently, you know, to help their overall health, I mean, I've done my job. Yeah, and I think that that is like all we can ask, right? You just got to make that impact on that one person and that would create ripple effects and different things like that. But yeah, there's there's a lot a lot that needs to be done and we all need to take our, our piece of that to, to really improve the health of all of those around us. You know, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, so moving on to the Furious Five, five questions I ask all guests. Number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? You may not know exactly what you want to do with your degree. Um, keep an open mind, like um, take advantage of the courses you're taking, build those relationships with those professors. Um, because I know a lot of these programs, as you get into like some more specialized classes, the class sizes do shrink, which is a good thing. Um, just build a rapport with those teachers because you never know what kind of things they can help you with in the future. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Number two. If you're talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? Come prepared. Um, like I stated before, um, utilizing your experiences to apply to the, um, you know, interview questions or reviewing the actual job description. Just, I feel like that's very important when people do go into a job interview, understand the job description, what exactly is it entailing and like probably doing research as or just look into their resume and say, okay, what can I apply to this position and when they're going to ask me certain questions? Yeah, that, good, good advice there. Oh, absolutely, too. Uh, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Um, probably just going with the flow. I mean, this year has been interesting. When I think about 2021, I literally feel like it's a continuation of 2020. Just accepting things how they are, like things are getting better regarding like COVID and stuff like that and the outside opening and feeling more comfortable going outside. Um, so just probably staying in the moment and utilizing um, the skills and the experiences that I am currently experiencing because I know that will help me in the future. And I know I'll be more appreciative. So just being more appreciative about staying in the moment and like what moment I am in my life because it could be worse or sometimes you think about it, it could be better, but hey, I'm in this particular spot in my life for a reason. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that is important to also like go with the flow and like enjoy life and don't fight back too much, but enjoy it for what it is. And yeah, so, so glad you share that. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? In regards to what? Uh, people have said like just ad professional advice. People have said like podcasts. People have said different resources, different people they listen to, podcasts, books. So you, you can oh, go okay. you can, whatever direction you'd like to go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think podcasts are great. I think definitely just getting a different perspective. Um, I think especially with a lot of these jobs positions, learning from people that are like more seasoned um, than you in a particular position. Uh, me able to accept, you know, criticism I feel like a lot of people especially us millennials we're like ah oh, we're gonna do it this way we know the way all this stuff but it's like you gotta have to kind of step a, take a step back and actually utilize advice and the information that people that are more seasoned than you in the position or anywhere just to be you know so you can be more productive I mean I've known for example for a previous position big brothers big sisters even with appearance i feel like a lot of times with millennials we want to come in a job looking any no you can't be looking any type of way coming to a lot of these people's jobs um i just feel like taking that criticism like hey maybe you should dress a, a certain way um just be more professional because i just feel like it's just really interesting to me even seeing like people younger than me coming into the positions and you know um not to say that it takes away from their you know their job performance but especially when you think about people of color like they're looking at everything like you have to make sure you're on your p's and q's dressing professionally because i'm just thinking like 
if you want to look up, if you want a certain position, you want to look the part because let's just say, if you want to be the CEO of the company, you can't come in the job looking at any, I mean, you could, but I mean, realistically, you want to look the part that you want to get. Yeah. For the majority of people. <laughs> yes. For the majority of people. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I think also I want to highlight like the accepting criticism or like being able to take um, critical feedback. I think that is hugely yes. important for your growth and, and understanding. So I just wanted to highlight that. So thank you for sharing those. Um, mm -hmm. And then number five, and last but not least, where can people connect with you? Um, they can connect with me on Facebook, um, LinkedIn. I'm trying to work better on being on LinkedIn. You can just look me up by my name, um, Facebook by my name, Ruth Cooper, um, and then Instagram as well. Okay, awesome. And I'll be sure to, and where, where on Instagram can they can they follow you? Okay, um, so my Instagram name is M-I-S-S -S underscore T-O-M-A. Miss Tuma? Yes. Okay, awesome. Well, I'll, I'll be sure to put those in the description as well as the show notes for anyone that, that would like to connect. Um, but thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. I greatly appreciate all your insights and your public health journey up to now. And we look forward to seeing where you, you go in the future. Oh, thank you so much, Amari. I definitely appreciate this time talking to you and connecting with you. So I definitely appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure, my pleasure. And then housekeeping items. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. Uh, be sure to subscribe, be sure to like, be sure to leave a review to share it with a friend, like literally, like go into the app, whatever app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and click share and share it in a message with a friend. Greatly appreciate that. If you'd like to support other ways, you can go to buymeacoffee.com forward slash the PH Millennial, or you can go to the PH Millennial.com forward slash support. Thank you all so much and see you all next week.